All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it is a, a beautiful day here in the Midwest, at least in Ohio, uh, nonetheless, and uh, really excited to have you uh, join us again for another really, really exciting uh, webinar and uh, really interesting and, uh, topic today. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Obviously, you, you all know Mid America uh, fairly well, but as you know, uh, we are a multi-state association that we really pride ourselves on being a leading resource for education, making connections and sharing best practices. And I think today you're going to see some of that uh, without question. Uh, I am Horton Hobbs. I'm uh, Vice President of Economic Development for the Chamber in, in Springfield, Ohio, but I'm honored to serve on the Board of Directors of Mid-America as well. And uh, feel free to uh, follow us on uh, all the social media platforms. And if you have any specific questions or want more information, please do not hesitate to visit us at midamerica.org. So I'm going to stop sharing. So now you get to see uh, all of our faces, or at least mine for just a second. Again, I want to welcome uh, our panelists today. We're going to have a great discussion about the digital transformation of economic development. And I'm very, very excited about uh, this topic, as I can tell you and attest to you personally and professionally that uh, these gentlemen here are industry leaders. They are ahead generally months, if not years of the pack in terms of helping determine and uh, develop uh, new trends in our in our field. And I will tell you that their uh, services and their council has changed our organization for the good. Uh, in many ways uh, and has made us a, a much better organization. We benefited from their work. So I'm very excited to learn more, hear more from our panelists. So today you're going to be joined by Anatolio Ubalde. He is the CEO and founder of Size Up. Anatolio, you can Thank wait. You. You're welcome. I also am joined by Chris Knight. He is the Chief Commercial Officer and Co-Founder of Wobtech. Chris, how are Hi. you? Welcome. And Aaron Brassois, founder of Golden Shovel Agency, uh, who has, uh, again, all, hey, Aaron, all of these guys are no stranger to Mid-America. That's why I'm not going to spend the extra time going through their bios, because I think many of us have seen those. And certainly we, I think many of us have all uh, met these gentlemen. So without further ado, I'm going to turn my screen share off and turn it over to Anatolio to kick us off. And again, thank you all. Uh, for participating. Don't forget to put that Q&A in the Q&A in chats if you have issues. Anatolio, take it away. So Horton, thanks for that introduction. I'm excited to be talking with you about the digital transformation of economic development. For those of you who are uh, have more questions or other things that we can't cover during this, my LinkedIn, I'm pretty easy to find. Starting with in terms of the topic of today, I wanted to first really kind of set the stage of understanding that what's happening is, is now all successful economic development has really become digitally integrated. It's not some separate thing. It's really at the core of the work that we're doing in economic development. And it exists within a context of the work that we're doing, but also what's going on globally, both in terms of public health issues such as COVID and the economy. So what's happening is that digital transformation and COVID have been working in ways that reinforce each other. And we'll, we'll certainly talk more about that. But what's happened is, is that economic development organizations knew they needed to go through this process of digital transformation. And they had plans. Maybe it was a two, a three, or a five-year plan. But what coronavirus did was it really compressed this so that what was years had to turn into digital transformation in a matter of months. Why? Because it's simply necessary to be able to achieve economic development goals. I would like to look at a, a survey that went out. Um, this is a national survey of economic developers looking at how they change their economic development work after coronavirus set in and a lot of the economy closed down. The main change was is local business assistance became the primary focus of economic development organizations, then followed by increased community relations and communications. But what's interesting is if you look at the third and fourth of the big changes, these are things that are technology related. So the first is increased focus using technology tools to work with your colleagues. And the second is focus and use and acquisition of technology to serve your customers, whether it's web conferencing or online chat, social media, 
site selection, local business intelligence, and so on. So two of the four biggest changes for economic developers were around technology. So really, whatever the economic development organization, your organizations are doing, you're being more effective using technology, either using technology to lead or as a supplement to your existing programs. I'm going to cover some of the key trends in economic development digitization, and I'm going to stay pretty high level. And then I want to get back to what you as economic developers are saying is most important to you. And that's where I'm going to spend most of my time. The, the first of the key trends is on local small business assistance. As you saw, that was a high priority. And that's actually what I'm going to talk the most about. A second one is, is that client relationship management software became very important. As things closed down, as people were working remotely or from home, what happened was a lot of economic development organizations got exposed in the fact that they weren't prepared to work in a truly digital distributed method. So they didn't have ways that they could communicate well with even their own colleagues or to track projects to know where things are because you weren't in the office to be able to just have conversations by the water cooler or things that were on paper no longer work. This was part of it. Another issue was is simply being able to communicate with your customers, whether they're the local businesses, some economic development organizations didn't have an effective way of communicating with the businesses in their own community and also those that they're talking to outside of their community. So there's been a clear move toward more use of client relationship management software. Another issue is virtual reality and online tours. Well, so much is now more virtual. And what economic developers are discovering is this is a great way to communicate information, to work with others, so that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can have either through virtual reality, a way to communicate with people that feels more natural, a little bit more normal as if we were in the same room, and also online tours of taking people through a community in ways that they can experience it without physically being there. Site selection has certainly also changed. And I think that we're in a place where it is unlikely that we will go back to how site selection was done pre-COVID. There was an article, I don't know if uh, you all saw it, but there's an article in Fast Company that talked about how this biotech company that was based in, I'm trying to remember, I think they're in Australia. They were doing a site selection project in the United States. They did the entire process online all of the analysis, the meetings, the communication, the tours of the location. And they're talking about it. The fact that it's in Fast Company, the, the secret is really out that you can do site selection virtually. None of their executives had ever stepped foot in Tucson, but they actually located their business there for an expansion. There's also a trend toward on-demand professional development. So this is really about our profession. And you can see it's happening because it's happening right now. All of us are getting this online and on-demand professional development. So this is causing changes, which I think that we're going to see with Economic Development Association. Video conferencing, obviously, nobody has spent more time on video conferencing than all of you have now since things have changed last year. There's also a lot more online collaboration. So the software that you all are using before may have been less collaborative, but now things like Google Suite, where you can go into the same documents and, and edit them and work on them collaboratively, that's also becoming important. In terms of business prospecting, in a situation where travel is limited and where the trade shows and conferences weren't happening, what became a very important way of doing business prospecting is by subscribing to databases and getting that information from people who or consultants who have access to this data. So this is, again, a way that digital has changed what used to be much more personal. And of course, websites. Your websites, it was the core, it was the center before, it continues to be so important. Of the many changes, one is that there is a new expectation. And the new expectation of your customers is that there is always a digital option and alternative to the way that they do business with you. And that's because we've all gotten used to it. And it works. And in some cases, it works better or it works very well as a complement to the work that you're doing. So I want to focus on that. what you as economic developers have said is your primary focus. And so that way we can talk about the issue of how digitization plays with your priorities. In the analysis, this national survey it asks, what is your highest priority in economic development now? And overwhelmingly, it's about assisting local businesses. And of course, this made a lot of sense because the economic devastation you experienced was very local. It was about the people that you know, your friends, the, the places that you would go to eat or to go shop. These are places that were really struggling. And 
they have a direct impact on your local economy. How much? Well, the local and small businesses actually have a huge impact. What we know is that that small businesses represent about half of the GDP of the U.S., but at a local level, for local economic development, there's a much bigger impact. And the reason is related to the multiplier effect of what happens with dollars in your economy. There's been quite a bit of research around this, and it all generally shows the same thing, which is that the local businesses and the locally owned businesses are where you get the most secondary spending and total economic impact. And it's meaningful. As these businesses are struggling or as they're succeeding, so goes the rest of your economy. We also know that small businesses create the vast majority of new jobs. Prior to the previous recession, I mean, it was 93% of all net new jobs. The numbers vary a bit, but generally it's around two thirds of all net new jobs. And as we look at how it's impacted coming out of a recession, we can look at the issue of total job creation. Well, what happens is, is that small businesses bounce back faster for total job creation, but you may be more interested in what happens with net job creation. Same issue. Small businesses have bounced back faster, at least in the last recession. And here's a a really big issue. As you're thinking about for you who are economic development organizations whose top priority is job creation, well, where are you going to get it? Well, if you just measure from 1993 to 2015, which is the range of date that we we actually have federal data on this, small business created 425% more net new jobs during that period. So if you invested only in small businesses and not on large businesses, and I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying if you did, you'd have 425% more success. Your communities are in a situation where your local businesses really want your help. They need your help a lot. I want to also talk about the, another trend that's happening, which is this trend of entrepreneurship. And there's, I'll put it into two different areas. One is that, that which is voluntary and the other which is involuntary. There are many people who are stuck at home or were not able to work as much as they want, who've always dreamed of opening up a business. And many of them today are opening those businesses. But there's also a segment, which are the people who have been put out of work, who out of necessity are going to have to be self-employed. Think about, well, where will the new jobs come from? I want to first step out of economic development and just talk about trends in general. And one of which is if we knew, right, if we knew that in March, so as things really got bad because of COVID, and this is where the stock market went to hell. If we knew then, if we put money in and we invested, that it would grow to the heights that it's at today, I think all of us in retrospect would say, oh, I should have put more money into the stock market. The next thing I'm going to show you is I think is going to blow your economic development minds, but it's going to take a little bit to explain it. I'll show you, this is the new businesses that have started over the past number of years. And you'll see that in the last recession, the numbers of new jobs kind of kept going down, whereas they started growing over time. And then some strange things happen in this current recession. And if you look at this data, it looks like things are in decline. But the problem is there's too much noise in this data. What I've done, because I'm kind of a data geek, is I've normalized this because you might not realize this, but business openings is actually happens by time of year. There are more businesses open at the beginning of the year than the end of the year. And what you'll see is, is that the growth has really kind of gone up. But the question is, of course, is what's happening this year and, and also what happened last year. So this is what happened last year. The two quarters that typically are the worst fiscal quarters for new business starts blew away all previous quarters. And it doesn't matter if it was even the best ones. And as we look at what's happening in Q1 of this year, which is typically the strongest, the numbers look very strong. For those of you who are focused on new job creation, what you can find is, is that of all of the types of companies, new companies create the highest relative performance in job creation. But there is a big problem related to this for economic developers. And that's that there's so many small businesses and entrepreneurs in your community, and they're all so different. And you only have so many economic development staff to serve all of your local small businesses. And many of the traditional tools and programs that we have in economic development, whether it be business retention and expansion or economic gardening, they tend to only serve a small portion of all businesses. 
What are the limiting factors? Well, one is, is the issue of scalability. Is there's only a small amount of small businesses that can be served through traditional face-to-face -face economic development programs. And there's also, depending on the size of your community, geography is an issue because some of these services may not be near the small businesses. What's happening is that this is part of the interconnection between the acceleration between digital transformation and this new reality of economic development, because digital tends to be better positioned to respond to the new demands that are being placed on you. So I'll share with you two solutions that have that are out there to overcome these barriers. The first is online training. And there's these MOOCs or massive open online courses provided by edX and also by Udemy. These are ways that businesses can get information. In the case of, of edX, they can get it for free. It doesn't matter where they are, what time they're accessing, they can get all of that information. This is a way for them to get smarter and learn how to do better. Another is the issue of online research. So economic developers can provide similar market research and business intelligence that typically only huge corporations have access to. And they're doing this through big data and they're putting these services right on the economic development website. To give you a sense of how much this has changed, and I'm just looking at a small sample of the, the people who are on the IEDC board of directors, one quarter of them moved to provide online interactive custom small business assistance on their websites last year. And many of these organizations were actually attraction only before. And this is another change, is that economic development's thinking more about the, the broader issues. So I want to close by talking about where I think things are going, and that is, is that I, I perceive there's going to be a digital arms race in economic development of the digital haves and have-nots, and this becomes the issue of kind of who are the winners and losers. I don't want you to think, oh, everything we did before is being thrown away. No, there's a transition, and it's becoming more comprehensive. So where did we used to compete? It was with out-of-town meetings, in-town meetings, trade shows and conferences on your website, uh, with having more staff and more budget. But now what are new ways that we're competing? Well, they're digital. It's virtual meetings. It's having more software, better software. You're still using your website. There's interactive software on your website, search engines, and social media. In this race where now the tools that make you successful or you fail become digital, more economic developers are simply going to have to get more and more of these digital tools. The, the days of checking off a list to make sure you have all of the needed digital tools, that's upon you today. And you do need to check off the list, but checking them off won't be enough. In the digital arms race between you and your competitors, you now need the best. This becomes the, the differentiator, right? It's no longer about having stuff. You need more of it and you need the very best. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker, Chris. San Italio. Okay, so just to, to continue on, and I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. So my company focuses on foreign direct investment. So for those of you who don't know who we are, um, Wavtech, our specialist FDI company, which helps attract foreign investors from all over the world. But we also have our own digital wing, and, and we, we build quite a few of the things Anatalio has mentioned and um, e-learning for FDI and EDO CRMs, diff different types of websites with clients. So we're coming at it from this angle and, and we do know the region well. So we, we represent Jobs Ohio in China, Korea and India. So we, we know the region, we know a lot of the advantages. So what I'm going to do is Anatalio had mentioned about using the data which is available. So I'm, at, I'm going to use data to showcase where we are following the pandemic in terms of FDI, where the opportunities are, what the prospects are, and then move a, a little more into to some of the things we're seeing people do around the world. So starting on the big picture of where we are in the world, you know, between 2018, 2019, projects or FDI projects declined by only 1%. So it was pretty consistent year on year. And, and going back over the previous years, it was pretty consistent. And then we get hit by the pandemic and to, for the whole year of 2020, we did decline in 37%. And you can see it really hit in Q2 onwards. So these are, are the actual official figures now for, for what happened last year. But 
the good news, well, good news, as good as it can get is in terms of the US, the decline was only 21%. So it wasn't felt quite as strongly in the US as many other parts of the world in, in terms of a decline in FDI numbers. So looking at it, when are we going to recover? And before I go into some of our forecasts on recovery sectors, markets, I thought it's worth noting that, you know, the recovery of FDI is not going to be uniform across all states and countries. You know, it will firstly depend on the destination of the FDI, how investors feel you have coped with it, how the rollout of the vaccination ha has been helping and have your local businesses opened you know, I'm based here in the UK and I, I would say we're not going to see an uplift in FDI until probably Q3 of this year. Then it will depend on the source market, you know, where the companies are coming from. Have their markets opened up? Have they resumed flights to, to your location? Can, can companies still do their site visits? Because we, can, we talk a lot about digital tools to identify an investor, to engage with it, to do virtual site visits but at some stage, the investor will still need to travel. So it's going to be important. Then, you know, FDI is going to recover faster in specific sectors, which we'll move on to, but a lot will also increase within the different tech sectors. You know, we see educational technology, people studying at home where we, we see e-commerce, fintech, all of these industries are, are growing. And then, Certain states um, that, that we've seen have got different policies and investment incentives, which are going to fast track the FDI recovery. So taking a look at, at the US and where we see the forecasts, you know, the, the top year for foreign direct investment in terms of project numbers was 2019 with just about 2000 foreign investment projects. But in terms of jobs created, sorry, to capital, and um, it, it was higher in 2017 when there was more manufacturing projects. We see the decline this last year uh, and we expect the recovery to, to be relatively slow and, and probably hit last or 2019 levels in 2023. Okay, so, and then it will continue to grow. We, we also looked at data um, as to where companies are planning to invest. So again, data can, there's so many surveys out there. There's online tools. We're using FDI markets from the Financial Times, looking at where companies are putting tips, hints, or leads that they're planning to invest. And interestingly, year on year, more companies this year are now considering North America than before. Okay, so, you know, a lot of that could be um, supply chain risk um, or it could be near shoring. There, there are many reasons behind it, but North America and Western Europe are, are where the majority of companies are now considering expanding to. We can also you know, take a look again using data to see what happened in different industries. You know, we'll have read in, in papers and stuff just how bad things have been in hotels, aerospace, automotive, but you can see that completely decimated, over 50% collapse in foreign investment within hotels. But yet there were still strong sectors. And, you know, we look at renewable energy. I, I think that's going to continue to, to gain importance this year. And it will be a key industry to be focusing on. And I, I even, I imagine the US will be different incentive policies put in place for renewable communications. You know, companies like Zoom that we're on now had a massive growth throughout the pandemic. Consumer products um, over here, one of the, the, the top thing to buy was bread makers. So again, consumer products growing a lot last year. But the growth that we see for the US just by taking a look at all of this data is really within semiconductors initially. And you know, we, we already see a bit of that with the, the near reshoring of, of companies. We then have got things within auto, pharmaceuticals, of course, I, I think renewable, this is conservative. I think there could be a bigger increase within that. You then have warehousing, which I think companies are going to want to have different warehousing in many different continents um, to ensure there's no disruptions to, to their distribution if ever there's like a, a fourth wave, a fifth wave of, of the pandemic. So again, 
I think another way to, to use digital tools is, is to refine your international strategy. Which markets should you focus on and what rationale behind them? Because I think for too long, many different states and cities targeted the same places. You know, everyone was targeting China, Germany, and Japan. And, and these are key markets, but there are also other markets which are maybe not quite in your focus that you will get better opportunities because everybody aren't targeting them at the same time. So you can see these, according to our forecasts, are going to be the leading source countries for, for job creation. Now, the US, it's huge, okay? It's gonna be number one. So I'm not just talking about getting FDI, there's gonna be domestic opportunities throughout. But what I thought was really interesting about the top seven source countries is that seven of these are now Asia. You know, there's China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and then ASEAN, we've got India. So there's big opportunity and Singapore from, from, from the Asia PAC region that, that we should be looking at. You know, Europe, it, it's always the same countries of Germany, UK, France. Okay, so taking a look at these and, and then the next thing I would be suggesting to, to use data before you just jump on a flight and go to some of these countries is to narrow it down and take a look at some of, say your key industries and then match the key industries to the key source markets. You know, so if I'm, I'm, my key target is pharmaceutical companies, well, the leading source markets are US, Japan, Germany, UK, and India. And, and matching this up with your key industries to the key world source markets, this can let you narrow it down to two or three markets which you should be focusing on. So I think using a lot of data and digital online tools can get you to this stage, then it's a matter of looking at how you're going to engage with the companies. Okay, so while we're not going to trade shows, we're, we're not doing all of that, we still need to engage. And DCI re released a study which showcases, you know, just the importance of website. And sorry, I know Anatalio mentioned that uh, I would touch an SEO, but I would actually assumed others were going to talk about websites. So I wasn't going too deep into it, but we, we can see if you look at internet, e-newsletters, now social media, these are all key um, techniques to engage with companies. You know, traditionally, uh, I typically say this is traditionally how we would try and get leads, events, advertising, direct mail, flyers, gifts, radio, television. I think, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's dead, but I think it needs to be redefined and it needs to be mixed up with digital aspects. So now I would think more, more focus on the website and all the plugins to the website, whether that's adaptive content, whether it's interactive mapping, live chat, SEO, lead tracking, all of it's going to be more important in your website now. I think an e-newsletter is something super simple to do, but it shouldn't just be for new business. You know, business retention and expansion is absolutely key at this time. And I think a newsletter is a great way to keep local businesses up to date with what, what's happening and, and the response to the pandemic and how things are reopening, new companies arriving. I, I think social media, my, my tip here is to change your mindset from, from being reactive and, and turn it into a proactive lead generation tool. You know, look at how you can have KPIs around it, how you can really monitor and get leads. You know, webinars, we're, we're hosting 24 webinars right now for um, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, and they're focusing each webinar on a key market and a key industry. So if you are doing webinars, my, my advice is to make sure they're sector focused. And, and don't aim for 500 people. You know, you're better getting 20 quality attendees who are engaged in answer, asking questions than 100 just to tick a box. So webinars can be very useful to get a message out to folks. Other things we're starting to see is, you know, multiplier marketing. So while people are not able to travel, they're, they're engaging with the site selectors who are in country, they're engaging with FDI consultants like ourselves, with recruitment and HR companies, with banks, legal firms, accountants. 
So you need to get in, in touch with all of these and you need to identify these organizations in your region to be speaking to, to so they can pitch your location, right? Because if I'm going to set up in, in the US and, and it's something we did during the pandemic, the first people we reached out to was our bank to see how we can set up a bank account in the US. And we, we're not able to do that virtually. So again, having FinTech and having digital facilitation is going to be really key um, for the next six to 12 months to try and get more business over the line and signed up. So we actually um, created an online database or a forum of all of these intermediaries or influencers where you're able to, to identify them. And, and what we've seen other people do is like in, in Calgary, they're, they're putting a map of all the local FDI multipliers on their map where you're able to engage with them through your website. So you're now using a digital platform to, to engage, to see investors engage with banks, to see them engage with accountants, legal firms. So when someone connects to the colliers, not only do colliers get an email, the EDO of Calgary get an email. So it turns it into a real digital lead generation tool. Then I know that this is probably outside the box. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how often this is talked about in the US, but we, we do a lot of work um, throughout Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And what they're working on now are what they call iPros or investment projects ready to offer. And this is basically where you have a project that you want foreign capital to invest in. So you've got it a, a full unique product or service and you know what the objectives and costs will be. Okay, so it's a real in-depth proposition on an investable opportunity. It typically is within infrastructure or tourism, but it, it's moving now and it, it can be within any industry. And I think it's easier to show you an example. And um, here, if you look at th this is, a region actually in Russia. And what they're doing, this region have decided there's an opportunity to create um, PPE equipment. What they have said is this operation will create 150 jobs and the investment needed is uh, 132 million rupees. It's a 100% foreign investor, the location, and this is what the return on investment for the investor is. So why is this important? Well, a lot of, large foreign investment and, and setting up of operations has stalled. You know, I think, what was it, 40% down last year because they cannot get abroad and implement and get staff and, and all of that. So what some of these EDOs are doing, are they're identifying an opportunity and a need in the market and they're coming up with a feasibility study and they're packaging it on, on their website so I can become an investor if I want to to set up a business in PPE equipment. They have told me how much it costs. They have told me what my return of investment would be in seven years. But what they have also done in this website is they have allowed other companies or other projects to submit it on their website. So someone can add a project, it gets approved within 24 hours, then becomes live on their website. This is a new model of FDI, which, which is really building momentum. And I think it, it will soon, you'll soon see more of it um, on your shores. So I thought to finish up just to touch upon that. And that, that is for me, I will pass on to Aaron now. All right, sounds good. Thanks, really uh, enjoy presenting with you, Chris and Anatolio. I have a bit of a fire hose of a presentation for you guys today, because I wanted to get into on top of the trends and build on what uh, these guys are sharing, but also just show um, some of the tools of the trade that we've seen over the last year. So the first trend that I will uh, hit on is remote worker attraction. Uh, this last year, we saw a lot of articles like this, people fleeing big cities may spur economic growth in smaller metros or seven reasons why 2021 will be even bigger and better for remote workers. You see the pandemic has made people realize that they want a little bit more space. Um, suddenly real estate uh, has been shifted to more rural communities and uh, certainly suburbs and, and mid-sized towns. I think that's just a huge opportunity for um, Mid-America uh, members. And so 
if you're putting together a remote worker strategy to attract them, what are the main things they're looking for? The first one is they're gonna want quality of life. If you can choose where you wanna live, you wanna pick out a good place. Uh, the cost of living being lower is really important. High-speed internet is absolutely critical. And I'd say uh, most people, especially in mid-America, you have to be able to find housing. That's certainly been, a, been an issue. This is the new kind of EDO website that we're seeing. This is coming from uh, EDC Mason out of Washington. We're close to Seattle, but we're a world away. Doesn't that look just like a breath of fresh air? Uh, here's another example in Greater Dubuque. We're seeing a lot of these microsites being built that are really just targeting towards talent attraction and remote worker attraction. Uh, you can check this one out, Big Life, Small City, your home in Dubuque. Um, in Montgomery County, Ohio, you can see some of their, this is one of their latest news articles, an exciting option for remote workers, putting together these success stories and getting them out. Um, in Greater Yankton, I think this, this is in South Dakota. These guys have been long before the pandemic hit, really focused on building a workforce attraction site. And this one is just incredible. Some of the things they've done are so creative. Let me just show you a couple of them. First of all, they put all the success stories of people that are thriving in Yankton that um, to share with other people. And what's neat about this is they can use these stories. Not only can the, the these are the types of people that they're trying to attract, but these people then can share them out to their friends and family, which tend to be of the similar uh, similar type. And when you get into it, here's a uh, Ben. He's a Yankton entrepreneur. They got videos of these people telling their stories. There's photos. There's um, sometimes they do interviews, um, just all really cool contact, uh, content to entice other people that might want to come and uh, live in the area. Another thing they put on their site is highlighting volunteer opportunities. So sometimes you have a, a trailing spouse or as a remote worker, you might be considering how you want to engage your new community. And frankly, the new generations don't engage the same way that they used to. I mean, they used to join chambers and elk clubs, and now it's going to be getting involved different ways and putting those opportunities on the website is a big advantage. Another thing they do uh, is 31 under 31. So every March, they highlight a new person in their community that uh, tell their story, what are they up to? What do they love about living there? And once again, they create in that month of March, 31 new pieces of social media content that these people can share out uh, with their friends and their family on Facebook and LinkedIn as well as um, it all gets put onto uh, the economic development site. And then once a month, they highlight one person that's lived there over 31 years, which is really cool and, and about their life and why they've been there so long. And it put a little perspective on the type of communication machine they've built is if you go to the Greater Yankton Living Facebook page, this is uh, about a month back, but they had 19,530 followers. So if you wanna make a, comment about the quality of life in your area and you can send it out to a place where you've got 19,530 followers already, um, you get responses and it really gets attention. So uh, don't underestimate uh, social media at all. That has become just tenfold what it used to be just in the last year. So um, these are some really great assets for attracting remote workers. And so we did actually, if you go to goldenshovel.com on the homepage, you can download a whole book that we did. Um, in fact, Size Up uh, participated on this as well as TIP Strategies and Underpinned. A great free ebook on thinking reforce, rethinking workforce attraction in the age of remote work. And uh, as Anatolio, I think, made very clear, there's been a massive shift to local business focus. Uh, when the COVID hit, I know our, our company got incredibly busy. We jumped in immediately trying to contact all of these different small businesses, making sure that they have all the information they need. And Anatolio, I mean, he covered it pretty well. The big problem is there's way more small businesses than there are a staff and resources to get to all of them. That's why there's always been such a focus on major employers and what are their needs, but what do you do? And suddenly you need to provide information to four or 5,000 businesses in a community when really you have the resources to get to 40 or 50 of them in a year. And so um, one of the tools that I know we've put onto a whole ton of websites this last year is the size ups, uh, 
local business intelligence tool. So I'll show you a couple of features of it that I think are really cool. So this one happens to be on the city of Dallas, but so check this out. You can go in here, you type in a coffee shop and you decide uh, the location. So in this case, we're in Dallas. Now all of this data is sitting here on the website. And so they can type in what they think their estimated revenue is gonna be or a year started or whatever information that they have. And this gets crunched with millions of different data points. And it gives them data that frankly was only available to larger consultancies back in the day. And this is data they can get on their own from your website without the economic developers having to call and uh, crunch all of this you know, for hundreds of businesses. And then this I think is a cool feature. You can actually compare how your business is doing over time from before. So you can say, all right, I've been in business 10 years and it'll tell you that your business is doing this much better than other businesses of a similar type from 10 years ago. It also compares it to national, uh, uh, national data also. And then you can see how do you size up based on like your salary, based on the number of people you've employed, it compares it to the other businesses. This is all a very difficult information to get. And it's nice to be able to offer this as a resource to small businesses in your community. Here's an example of uh, comparing the employees. And so then in the end, you get this whole dashboard of what you can expect and uh, you can compare your uh, business to other businesses and see, uh, get a lot of the information that frankly you'd be going and sharing with your small businesses anyway. And as Anatalio had noted, this is where all the job creation is happening. And so it's um, just a really powerful tool. So highly recommend taking a look at that. And as, oh, I should also note uh, this piece too. You can actually compare it out to zip codes and you can see like, what, where are the opportunities for an entrepreneur perhaps to open up something new. You just heard today about the huge influx of entrepreneurs and where that's going. Uh, these types of tools give them the information that um, they may not be able to get just from a, you know, economic developer reaching out. Oh, and demographics, of course, for uh, everybody in the area uh, to be able to make sure that you know that you got a market. So that's uh, local business information. Definitely uh, take a look at that. Another big trend, uh, uh, Chris had mentioned on it, geopersonalization. This is the idea that you can change the data that's on a website so that it, depending on where the person is coming from. So right now the websites look something like this. You have to kind of combine the foreign direct investment information with how happy your so CEO is doing and of trying to talk about your training programs, try to put all your COVID stuff in there and then also highlight your local talent. When instead, if you knew that somebody was coming from a certain spot, so like, well, I know that my, that somebody's coming from California, I'd rather have my website look like this. California business moves to town. This is the top place to work. I love moving here from California. Uh, that'd be more uh, influential to somebody coming over from California. Or if you're coming from Europe, wouldn't it be nice to have your foreign direct investment stuff first? So European companies thrive here. This is a great US location. What an easy transition from Europe. Here's a success story. Um, you can make all this happen and change the content on the fly on the website. If they're local, then wouldn't it be nice to have, hey, here's where your local support is. Here's where the size up tool is. Here's your homegrown success of, here's uh, the people that started here and are expanding. Um, people in your community wanna know that the economic development organizations have their back. And that'd be, that's a way to put all of that information up front where it might not be as relevant to somebody internationally or out of state. Here's a really quick example just on, here's the Golden Shovel homepage. But if you go to that same page from California, you're gonna see this as the header of our home homepage. If you go in there from uh, Texas, you'll see something else. We can change the testimonials and stuff all to be related to the, the state that they're coming from. So this was a pretty exciting uh, introduction, new technology that came out last year that we've been implementing across economic development sites. Another quick one, uh, digital lead generation. The lead generation's gone to the websites, just like it have been uh, talking about. And we're still doing the same approach, which is taking the focus on success stories, creating stories that are, and then getting the right audience, but we're doing it all digitally now. So it's going all through social media, 
off a lot of LinkedIn, off a lot of Facebook, and then it all comes back to the websites, where in this case, this is Roseville, Minnesota, where they have their success stories of all the different businesses that are thriving in their region. When those, when those marketing stories come back to the site, that's where we can track them and we can use tools like lead forensics, uh, which we put into all of our sites that allow us to not just see how many people are visiting the site and where they're going, but connecting where they're coming from. Like if your marketing piece worked back to the site and then being able to highlight that uh, um, the actual company that it is. And so once you have that information, you can add them to your uh, potential leads down the road. And that's where it's really important to have a powerful CRM. You're going to need some way to manage this. You know, hope to God you're, you're not just using a Excel spreadsheet. Um, and this is one that we highly recommend. This is Waptex Amplify. Uh, they have so much data and so much information. And this was built specifically for economic developers versus other tools like Salesforce, et cetera. And it covers the, all the different steps of the projects, um, where your leads, uh, the stages of the opportunities that are out there so to make sure that you don't miss any of the steps when courting. And then even uh, potential leads that come out and where they might be, being able to tie all that together to the CRM so that when you do your marketing and those leads do come back, there's a place to, to put them so you can do nurturing and follow up with them. So it's all a, a huge part of the digital transition is digital organization and making sure that um, you're effectively hitting the right audiences. And the last thing I'll hit on is uh, virtual tours. And so um, for those who are familiar with Golden Shovel, you're probably familiar with Place VR and that we've been doing an awful lot of focus on using virtual reality. And when COVID hit, we had a 400% increase of interest in this because suddenly we're able to, to take a, a VR headset, we can view 360 videos and create this feeling as if you're actually standing there on that location. And when you couldn't travel in person, we certainly could send a disinfected headset to somebody and share the experience of, of going on a fam tour or going on a site tour with, uh, with the, the audience. Uh, this is the uh, latest uh, headsets that, that we've been using and that our clients are using, the Quest 2. And it allows you to uh, not just view all of the, the 360 virtual reality content, but also have virtual meetings. You can also put these 360 videos on your website. They work on tablets um, inside the headsets and can really use them uh, for all types of virtual presentations. And so I think I'll do real quick, a couple of minutes left. I'm going to show you just a quick clip of this video. So this gives you a little better idea of how this technology looks. So if I had a VR headset on, I could be looking up, down, left, right. It's like having a video that's inside a big bubble with you in the middle. Uh, this was actually shot up in the apex region of Minnesota. You can go back at different times of the year and try to capture different seasons. So here it goes from summer to winter. Um, this is built kind of by where I'm at right now in uh, Santa Cruz, California. Um, trying to capture the quality of life is important. We'll come back uh, at times when there's festivals and can sometimes get on stage and just highlight the things that are really unique. This is in Buffalo County, Wyoming. Uh, we, for site visits, we can cover like new construction. We've done quite a bit of work with drones. You can take greenfield and brownfield sites and put 3D models on them, just make them appear. And if you can imagine inside the VR headset, the experience is that you're standing there uh, with these things, these visions in existence. Everything in this picture is totally made. It's a 3D model with an exception of that one train on the left. That's a real video. But this one is, uh, the one that virtually appeared is virtual. So and an interesting approach. Now we're able to do these 3D facility scans. You can actually go inside a building and walk through the whole thing. So someone from overseas or afar can walk through an existing facility. And it's so accurate. It makes a 3D model of the whole building. You can actually do measurements and the like to see if uh, your equipment will fit in the, in the right places. So it's pretty, pretty incredible. And then the last thing that we've been doing uh, quite a bit of work on 
is going is making a whole system for virtual meetings. And the idea of that is you have a virtual conference table, you can bring up to four other guests, so it's five people total. And this is the Place VR Meetings app. You can actually bring the people into your 360 video tours and give them that tour so that they can, uh, it's just like giving a fam tour, it's in 3D sound. Um, just, a, just really incredible. Here they are, downtown London. And give me an example, you can go into say, this is in York County. Here's my guests that are giving a tour to my colleagues. You can see they're inside these Place VR uh, suits. This is from Olson. This is the engineering firm. Just to speed it up for sake of time, you can see how that building appears out of nowhere. And now I'm I'm sitting here with my my guests talking about this particular opportunity. So um, certainly feel free to reach uh, reach out if you have any uh, questions around uh, around that. And then just to wrap it up here. Let me, oh, there's an example of that 3D model. And then I was just gonna say there is an ebook available. And then lastly, these same tours, this 360 video and all of this can be put into uh, one of GIS Planning's brand new products, the Zoom tour, which we think is just super great. You can um, put that 3D, this is one uh, from uh, Montgomery County, Ohio, where I put a, a whole Matterport tour and 360 videos right inside that tour. So great. I see uh, I see Horton on. I better uh, show up for questions. So uh, thanks so much. And feel free to reach out for any more information regarding uh, what we showed. Oh, you're muted, Horton. Dag Nabbit, I'm always saying I'm not going to be that guy. And I am that guy once again. OK, that's all right. Uh, once again, you guys always do such a wonderful job and certainly highlight the, the key uh, trends. Uh, you, true to your form, are ending right on time. So we really only have time for maybe one question or so. And I think it's really appropriate for the majority of the communities uh, that are represented in Mid-America. Do, do you think that smaller cities can really be digitally competitive? You know, and and I'll, I'll throw that to Anatolia first and, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I actually think that the biggest opportunity is for small and medium sized cities because digital strategies can actually help level the playing field so that they can compete. I mean, the internet is accessible worldwide. They can have just as much access as big cities. And in fact, what you're seeing is, is that small and medium sized cities are using leapfrog technologies that even large cities don't have. I'll use a, a very local example, which is, you know, which is ex, expand uh, Spring, is Springfield with like Horton's comp organization. So you think about Springfield, Springfield is about 60,000 people and the, the county is about 134,000. But it is, it's not Columbus, it's not Dayton, but it has technologies on its website that are better than what's available in the communities, the bigger communities that it competes with. So I see digital as a way for small and medium-sized communities, suburban communities, to be able to really outperform and outcompete their economic development colleagues from big cities. Wow, that, that's a great, that's a great answer. Thank you so much for the plug too. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can't say enough. I, I, I think the integration of the technologies we certainly have enjoyed uh, and, it's, and it's made the difference. And, and I will tell you the Size Up platform alone helped create two businesses in our community right during a pandemic. So these, are, these tools are, I can tell you firsthand, we don't have a huge budget, but these tools are accessible to most organizations. They're scalable, they're accessible. And um, I really encourage uh, everybody on this call to, or on this uh, webinar to at least look more into them. I wish we had more time to, to go back and forth because uh, you are three of my favorite people and I enjoy uh, just listening to you guys uh, talk through the, 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 ch the trends and the changes in, in our industry. And thank you so much for being so cutting edge and always willing uh, to share your thoughts with our group and uh, really appreciate your time. So I'll give you a virtual hand uh, clap uh, really on behalf of our board of directors and uh, our, our entire organization. I want to thank each and every one uh, of those uh, attendees and participants that have been on the call today. 
Uh, we know that your time is extremely valuable and, and certainly um, scarce. And so for you to carve out an hour and three minutes with us uh, is certainly much appreciated. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank you.